Um, what we're going to go over here basically is we're going to talk about how we do backups at Facebook, how we manage the quantity of data we have. Um, my name is Eric Barrett. I uh, work on backups at Facebook. That's kind of my, my title. I guess you could call me a storage engineer, but I do mostly programming now. Um, my coworker here, Kevin Knapp, is going to be speaking briefly after me about um, some of the um, just data movement methods we have there. And I do want to highlight my, my coworker, Stu, here, who works with me in the Dublin office here. He does a lot of great work on our backups, too. So um, I want to ask us questions afterward, uh, feel free. And uh, where these slides are going to be online. After the talk, we're going to have them on Percona's website for their usual procedures. So uh, as I'm going along here, I can sometimes speak a little fast. So if you're not catching something, if you're not following something, please feel free, raise your hand, ask me a question. If it's answered in a later slide, I'll let you know. But uh, you know, if it's just something I can give clarity about, then uh, not a problem. So let's talk about what gets backed up at Facebook. So I don't know how many people here went to the uh, the talk earlier uh, given by uh, Continuant about uh, kind of basic. It was uh, like a basic backup overview. All right, see a few people. So uh, I'm not sure that we follow the rules he laid out for. Uh, for uh, like limitations of things. We actually run MySQL dump on every single database we have daily. So it's uh, the, reason we, the reason we like MySQL dump is uh, manyfold. The reason we dislike MySQL dump is manyfold. We'll go into that in a little bit. Um, we get bin logs, streaming bin logs of every database instance, which we have. Um, we're pretty good about keeping those up to date. We basically treat our, some of our backup servers as replication slaves. So we're always having a, the bin log changes streamed to those guys. And that allows us to do point in time recovery if necessary. Uh, we get those for both the master and the slave because at the scale we're at, you get all kinds of weird problems. So sometimes there's a transaction on the master or a transaction on the slave that you need to get to the other system. And uh, we are currently uh, experimenting with binary backups on slaves. Um, that's been uh, a little bit of a challenge just on, in terms of the data that those create, because obviously binary backups are going to be a lot bigger than MySQL dumps. Um, but uh, we're uh, kind of developing that operationally, and we'll probably be doing that uh, on a much greater scale at some point. So we'll talk about that. Let's talk about what we do, our architecture here. Go ahead. So how big is each database? Uh, I can't give you numbers, sorry. Uh, our legal team likes to say no y axis. So, but uh, I would say that uh, the scale here we're talking about, we, we are of course a massively sharded environment. Um, so the databases are, one of the interesting things actually is the databases are going to vary very widely in size. You're gonna have databases that are, um, you know, a tenth the size of others, even though they are part of the same, they're shards of the same environment. So we basically have to handle everything. What's the, what's the time frame on a dump? I'm sorry? What's the time frame for a dump? The question was, what's the time frame for a dump? The, uh, so we aim to have every MySQL dump complete in tw um, 24 hours um, for a given DBID. And of course, we're going to have multiple databases per host, per physical host. So uh, basically, if we don't get something backed up in the first 24 hours, we're going to prioritize that next time around uh, if we can't finish that whole host in the time. Uh, I'll get into that. Okay, so the stages here we have for backups. We have what we call a stage one copy, which is where we're actually getting the data off of the database to a storage host. So the key here is we actually have a storage host that is not a database server. It's not running MySQLD in every rack. We call that the RBU for rack backup, um, but it doesn't really matter what we call it. This is the first stage. The what that host does is it runs specialized software that will actually connect to every database in its assigned IP range, which is typically the rack. And it will see, um, we'll use our, some of our internal mechanisms to determine whether that's a production database or not. And if it is, we'll go ahead and kick off a MySQL dump. Uh, we actually go for, we do two at a time right now, I think, two MySQL dumps at a time for hosts, but it depends on, uh, it's going to depend greatly on the load for, you know, for the host, and it's going to depend also on how much CPU is available, which varies quite a bit. Um, so the interesting thing about this first stage, though, is that our goal is not huge retention on this host. We basically need to get the data to that host uh, quickly, efficiently, and then we need to get it to 
stage two. Stage two is the meat of our backup system. Stage two is actually a number of very large Hadoop storage clusters. Stage two is where we have our kind of our, I, would guess, I guess you would say our, our uh, frontline retention policy. So if we are going to need to ever do a restore from a backup, then we want it to be in stage two because stage two is very large. It's very widely scaled. It's Hadoop, so you can get uh, a lot of very efficient I.O. being written to it from it. And uh, it's much more redundant because you are talking about separation of physical hosts here. An RBU is just one host sitting at the top of the rack and it's just got a file system on it and that can, you know, bad things can happen to that, right? Hopefully they don't, but this is the real world and this is at a large scale, so bad things do eventually happen. So we'd like to get our backups directly into a place where we can keep it uh, physically redundant. It's kind of a theme of our backups, it's physically redundant. We have a cluster for every data center to minimize network traffic. And then the final stage is um, we go from the stage two cluster to a longer term retention period um, on our stage three cluster, which is in a physically separate environment. In other words, a different data center. And that's for, of course, DR purposes. This diagram here might help explain that a little bit. You can see the arrows. Red arrows are stage one of the database racks copying to the RBU host, which may or may not actually be at the top of the rack, but you know, that's, uh, that's an easy way to think about it. Call it top of rack backup. From there, their job is to copy it to the stage two cluster. And from there, it goes to our stage three cluster. Any questions? In the back? All right, so that's actually a good question. Um, the answer is, it used to be uh, buffering from the the network at the top of the rack to stage two because the top of the rack because of the arc, the network architecture the top of the rack might or might not have had limited bandwidth um, and so that's actually something we're continuously reevaluating because it does seem if you actually draw it out sometimes it's kind of it looks a little redundant so right now it's the stage one uh, system runs custom software to pull it's a basically run MySQL dump it, you, it's not that hard to run MySQL dump, but of course it has to be aware of our environment. Um, and then buffer that on the local disk, and then it copies it to the Hadoop cluster, which is stage two. So, um, the end, yeah. Sorry, in the back. It, it copies. So stage one has a retention period, and stage two has a retention period. We don't really care what the retention period is in stage one. As long as it gets to stage two. That's the important thing. It has to get there. Are you counting from? Yes, they're live when the MySQL dump is happening, or the or the binary backup. Sorry, are you doing like a single transaction? So you're. What do we do? We do we do. I don't think we do single transaction. I think that the uh, the buffer tool gets the buffer, not the buffer pool. What is it? The. Uh, thank you. The history list length gets a little bit too long when we do that. So. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So if you're talking about like per table consistency, that's a whole separate topic. Um, but yeah, the, it is a usable backup. So. Uh, what was the reason for not using the incremental backup? Extra backup and incremental backup? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, but I will go into that. So some of the constraints we have found in this architecture, which has actually worked pretty well for us, but I'll go into the constraints first. Uh, we find the top of the rack host can get overloaded a little bit. This happens especially if you're running uh, a more conservative RAID on it, like RAID 6, uh, which isn't real good with writes. Uh, one of the solutions we came up with was put two per rack there, which is obviously a little expensive because A, you're paying for twice the storage hardware, and B, you're displacing a database host. The other solution we came up with was actually changing the RAID on that device to RAID 0 or RAID 1. This was a um, kind of an interesting uh, conclusion we came to because that was, we were, as we were developing this architecture, we realized that the first stage is retention period didn't matter so much. So we can use RAID 0 
and if the box gets wiped out, like if it loses a drive, everybody knows with RAID 0, if you lose a drive, you've lost the file system, right? Well, if the box gets wiped out, we re-image it with our standard processes. We fail over the, the backup duty for the period of that re-imaging. And then we, we move back onto it, and now it's clean, but hopefully it's been catch, uh, keeping up with stage two replication, so we haven't really lost anything. Maybe we've lost some time, if we lost an hour of backups or something like that. We'll just redo them, that's fine. Um, so, the other, but what we found actually when we used RAID 0 was that uh, bit error or byte errors, grown, grown sector errors on disks actually caused a little bit of a problem with the file system and IO errors that would crop up there. And it was something we probably could have worked around with software, but, but uh, we decided to go to RAID 1 for that just to get uh, basically write throughput because RAID 1 gives us very fast write throughput. It gives us complete protection from media errors that might disrupt the backup. And uh, of course, it takes a lot more space because you're dedicating half your disks to mirroring, but we don't really care about that on stage one. The whole goal here is get everything to stage two, get everything to Hadoop. Now, when people talk about MySQL dump, this is usually the biggest problem people have with MySQL dump. So, uh, the, it's basically I.O. So database hosts, as you know, when you were doing MySQL dumps, they take huge amounts of I.O. because they're basically doing a select star from every table, and then they're parsing that into SQL on the back end. Or MySQL dump is doing that. Um, so we find with binary backups, the gentleman earlier asked about extra backup binary backups, we find that uh, binary backups are, of course, much better at this because you're doing a sequential read on the file system rather than what could end up being a random read, depending on your insert order and your indexes. We also find that binary backups are significantly larger, even when you compress them, because not only are you copying your data, which basically turns into insert statements in MySQL dump, you're also copying all your indexes, you're copying sections of blocks that are unused, so like if you grew a table and then you, you dropped a bunch of rows from that table, there's gonna be a lot of probably empty bytes that you're still copying if you're doing a binary backup. Um, we also find that management of binary backups is fairly complicated. Now, of course, like I was saying earlier, um, Coworker Laughlin actually has a bi uh, an extra backup manager that handles a lot of this if you're looking at this in your environment. So um, definitely would encourage talking to him about that. But the, it's an open source project. But, uh, but overall, if you're looking at deploying binary backups in your environment, you should definitely be aware that management of them is much more complicated because um, if you're dealing with incrementals, which you pretty much have to if you're dealing with a reasonable amount of space um, for storing your backups, then you need to not only keep your incremental backups around, you need to keep your original binary backup around. So it's not just as simple as, oh, I have eight copies of it, so I need to delete the, you know, anything older than eight days. However, we're still evaluating if the production gains are worth it in our environment. So. Talk about how we do recovery on Facebook a little bit. So we have developed a bunch of tools in our environment, again, pulling from stage two here, where we can pull a backup to a single host. We have a recovery tier that uh, Stu's been working on quite a bit that does continuous validation of all of our backups because one of our favorite maxims is if you don't have, if you've never done a restore, you don't have backups. We have a bunch of additional scripts for single table restores, which really aren't that complicated, but they do exist if we need them. And um, Vomsi's done some work on single table restore for extra backup, which is pretty nice. You still have to backup the entire database. You can't do selective table backup, but you can restore just a single table. So for our continuous restores, basically what we have, uh, what we've set up is we've got a restore server that runs on a given host, which for this host, we really don't care too much about the performance, except insofar as we have enough to do our recoveries. Uh, this restore server coordinates a bunch of MySQL Ds, I'm sorry, to do our recoveries in a, in a given period of time, which is our goal for you know testing our, our backups. So this, re this restore server runs a bunch of MySQL Ds, copies the data from our second stage of backups, which I referred to earlier, as our kind of our, our locus for backups. And then um, applies that to, basically if it's a binary backup, it will apply the log, load it up with a MySQL D, do the recovery, and then 
connect to it, or if it's a MySQL dump, it will basically just replay the statements back into the database. Once you've done that, you have a complete copy of the database as it looked when you backed it up, and then we do some sanity checks, such as checking row counts, that kind of thing. Um, if, any, if anybody has worked with MySQL dump in the past, you know that you can sometimes get weird behaviors with you know, foreign characters, or um, we've seen cases, for instance, where in certain statements just weren't there, all you had was the DDL. Um, so, of, of course, we want to catch that if that's happening in any kind of mass way in our environment, which, which it hasn't. For the most part, things just work, but we do want to be aware of that and do our due diligence. So our goal for this is basically to restore everything within a certain number of days to make sure that our backup environment stays intact. Yes, question? So the question was, how do we know if our restore is good? So that's actually a really hard question. Um, I think that if you ask a bunch of different people, very smart people, you can get different answers on that. But I think that I think that we would all agree that a restore is good if if you get all the data you backed up back from it, right? So the question is, how do you check the data you backed up? Well, if you're doing a binary backup, of course you have the uh, the page checksum for the NODB blocks. If you're doing a MySQL dump, that's a little harder because you don't have that sort of metadata. So so. What we're looking at basically is is row counts and some basic data verification. It's, you know, in anybody's environment, it's going to depend on your schema, because in, in any complex environment, you're going to have tables that grow more than others, or some tables may be empty, some tables may only have ten rows, but they're very important rows, that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's going to the answer is basically it's almost metaphysical. It's is this the data you wanted to get back when you did the restore? If the answer is no, well then you need to you know figure out how to test that. But, uh, but basically, we're looking at, uh, at are the tables we expect there, are the row counts we expect there, that kind of thing. Yes, Christian. How, how do you deal with the table, uh, tables being dumped in different timeframes and playing binary logs back that? Uh, so actually, that, that actually can be a problem if you're trying to do a point in time recovery for a database and you're basing it on a MySQL dump. That's one of the advantages of bin logs, actually, is that when you have done the apply bin log phase or the apply log phase of the recovery, that everything will be at a consistent point in time. Whereas if you're doing per table backups and you don't have a um, you don't have a single transaction there, then you're going to have that issue. You're going to have the replay is going to be ragged, basically. Um, so the actual, I would say, the production, the Facebook answer to that is is replicas. And if you've lost all your replicas and you're having to restore from backups, then then something is pretty bad. And we try to avoid that scenario at all costs. So. But the point that you Right, right. Yes, they will. They will have different uh, start points for replaying the bin logs. So the answer is there's not actually a good way to deal with that right now. If you're trying to apply bin logs on top of a, a restored MySQL dump that wasn't single transaction, that's actually a pretty nasty scenario. So we try to avoid that with replicas. So, like I said earlier, our goal for testing backups is once every 30 days. Uh, that's per database. So every database we have ideally should be, should have been restored once in the last 30 days. Uh, we think that does a pretty good sweep of our. We also have an alarming system internally that this hooks into. Yes, question in the back. The question was, how do we test a resource? I'm, I think we talked about that a little bit. I, is there a specific like? You mean the extra backup images? I see. Okay, so well, again, it's going to depend on the schema, but uh, for the most part, we're looking for uh, we're looking for valid row count or like expected row count, and we're looking for uh, the fact that the data is there at all. You know, if um, if you're talking about binary backups, there is an NODB checksum per per page that's going to tell you if you have any corruption there. And if you're talking about MySQL dumps, well, if the data was corrupt in the first place, the MySQL dump probably didn't work. So then you're going to get suspicious row counts. Uh, that's what we found so far. Um, or if there's a parsing error with with 
you know, um, basically with with bytes that were transcoded incorrectly to ASCII. So. Questions? All right. So what we find we do a lot if we're going to do a restore, we do single table restores. Um, this can happen sometimes on uh, developers on their development databases where they say, oh, you know, I, I was testing this code on my development database and I dropped the wrong table, so can you get this table back for us? That happens a lot. Uh, of course, these are on development databases. We don't want them on the production stuff. Um, so what we do when we are doing recoveries is uh, we, we pull from stage two because we found, ironically, it's actually faster to pull from the Hadoop cluster than it is to pull from the top of rack system even if it's in the same rack as the database we're restoring to. Um, that's because if you're doing any kind of wide restore, then you're going to get bottlenecks on individual hosts, whereas Hadoop is going to be very good at spreading that load across the entire cluster of systems, even if it's a smaller number of systems, or even if on the network they're more distant. If we are doing single tab table restores, that's one nice thing about MySQL dump. So even if you're not using per uh, a single transaction MySQL dump, a single table is still going to be consistent. So if you're restoring a single table, then you don't have to worry about so much about the uh, the statement currency on that. So if you are going to apply the bin locks to that afterwards, then, then at least that table will be in a standard point. It does take a lot of I.O., or a lot of time, I should say, not so much I.O., but a lot of time after you've taken a binary backup to apply the log, so we don't do that currently. Um, it would take a lot more resources to do that, so that's one of the reasons, we're, one of the things we're looking into for this. Um, we do also find that we use the bin logs that have been streamed to the RBU all this time al alone a lot more frequently than with dumps. Sometimes we use them for catching up replicas, sometimes we use them for, uh, you know, if, if a statement went through that did something strange, we can use the bin log to, um, to uh, recover that. Or if a master, I'm sure we've all seen that scenario where a host kind of shudders and then dies, but after it, before it died, it basically spent a couple minutes in a zombie state and we need to get that data back. Of course, that will have been sent to the RBU under good circumstances, so we'll be able to get that there and avoid data loss, which is, of course, anybody's goal. So I don't have any more slides, but if anybody has any more questions about that, about our backup system here. Front row. So you're not using the system Right, right. If if you if you have, I think it's true of any system with replication or with, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll just call it replication. If you have a live replica, that's a lot easier to pull from than a, than a cold backup or a semi cold backup, right? And that's that's basically what we try to go for here. So operational failures like your system loses a disk or gets file system corruption or something like that, we're definitely going to look at the replica first before we look at the backup. Yeah. This is this is for archiving. This is for this is for yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in so, let me actually have a slide that illustrates that. That might have gone a little too fast over. So, we have three stages. So the first stage is actually uh, in the same rack as the database. And that is basically the system that's running the software that does the MySQL dump or the binary backup to it. And it's also the system that's receiving the bin logs. Oh, the SQL servers are local storage. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah. So was that, that was your question, is where's the storage for the SQL server? Um, I don't know if I can go into the individual configurations of the servers. Yes? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, so the question was, if, if there's a failure, can you lose worth of, uh, up to one day worth of data? The answer is uh, ideally no, because for several reasons. Um, we will have replicas in other regions that should have been kept up to date. If a, if a replica is not up to date by various methods, you know, we all know about seconds behind master and that sort of thing, but, but if a replica is not up to date, then we will pull out the stops to make sure it is up to date. Um, so, at the so if, assuming you're doing your due diligence with replicas, then you're only going to be as far behind as replicas are. Furthermore, 
the master is going to have been streaming the bin logs to the RBU at all times, or they may still be available. The bin logs may still be available on the master itself for recovery, depending on what actually happened to it. Uh, so even if you are going to a replica, you can still get those bin logs from the master. Also, the master is sending those to the RBU, the, the stage one backup, so we can pull those out and back it up. So, so no, we're, we're never looking at one day of data loss here because of multiple layers. Question? With multiple character sets, um, I actually don't know how we handle the character sets in the schema. Um, I think we're pretty, I think we try to be pretty consistent with those and just avoid that problem entirely. It's one of those thorny issues that's you know. It's just binary data, so we let the application figure that out. All right, number no uh, question in the back. So the question was, if you're restoring various shards, is the plan to restore each shard to a particular point in time? Um, I think that's going to depend heavily on the recovery scenario. Right? If you're talking about replacing a host that failed for which there was no valid replica, which ideally should never happen in our, in our environment, then you're going to basically restore it to us as recently as possible. If you're talking about recovering data in a particular time for, say, application corruption, then it's going to be a little trickier. It's going to depend on uh, exactly what tables, what schema was affected, that kind of thing. So. Right. I see. So the question is, can we restart every? Can we restore every shard to a given point in time simultaneously? I think the answer to that day, to that right now, would be probably not. But I don't know that that's particularly critical for our, for our application because we're not looking at, if we're in that scenario already, then things are pretty far south. We try to avoid getting there in the first place. Yeah, uh, that, you know, we have the replicas and the binary backups for host level restores to a given point in time. So the dump is mostly, again, like you said, it's, it's for table level whoops. Right. And of course, you know, given that what we're talking about here is the data from the users, like clicking on likes, status updates, that kind of thing, there's no, operational reason why we're going to want to go back to a point in time globally, right? So that would be highly, highly, highly unusual. So question in the phone. Do you have any single tables that can't be dumped within a 24-hour time frame? Single tables that can't be dumped? No, we have no tables like that that can't be dumped. So that within a that time frame. No, we don't have that. So if a system can't keep up with the backups in a 24-hour time period, the database server itself is probably overloaded in our environment. So it could be it could be the backup server is overloaded too, but that's kind of where, where it's at. So. All right, hand it over to my coworker, Kevin, and we'll talk about so other stuff, other stuff, data around. Yes, go ahead. Is there anything that you do on the restore uh, end to speed up the rebuilding of the On the restore end to speed up the rebuilding of the table? Right. Um, well, so if we're doing the restore, uh, it depends on how, what the restore method is. It's going to be, um, if it's a, yeah, so, yeah, well, I mean, that would be one thing we would we could do is is do the load and then add the indexes afterward. Uh, if, depending on, you know, if it's a MySQL dump, obviously you can do that. If you're doing a binary backup or a binary a restore from a binary backup, you get the index for free because it's already been backed up. Yeah, and MySQL dump, yeah. SQL log bin zero, um, uh, build your indexes later. Uh, we have you know, other tools for that, the, op the online, the open source uh, online schema change, things like that. So, <clears throat> my name is Kevin Knapp. I work on the uh, Facebook database operations side. Um, we, uh, our architecture has changed a lot over the last few years, and aside from backups, we move a lot of data around simply because our use of the data has changed. So we moved it from another system, another sharded architecture, or maybe we just have a whole new set of tables, but we want to move the data from an old schema into this new one on the same system. Um, we find that uh, the most common thing 
I think most of us in the room would come up with that is let's say you have a bunch of CSVs and you want to load them into MySQL instances that are sharded, load data seems like the best solution. And for a DBA, it usually is. It's fast, it's easy to use. So some years back, we had a script that we could use to move data around, and it simply kind of did for each database, look in this path and load data as needed. It kind of worked at a small scale. With only a few hundred servers, the odds of finding an edge case were pretty small, and our data really wasn't that big back then. Um, and, and again, load data is really fast, so that's the fun part. The downside, can't always have a uh, DBA around to hold someone's hand when they're migrating application data around. So the main problems with load data, obviously slave lag. Since we're stuck in single threaded replication, load data ruins everything. And since we're doing a web application, we want those updates to come quick. So waiting on even 30 seconds for load data means some replica somewhere is serving stale data. And if you've been on Facebook and you click on something, an update, and you come back and you see you haven't seen it yet, that's usually the cause. The other thing is load data can overload a busy host. Long running transactions are bad. And of course, depending on your, uh, your disk layout, that large tempter might, uh, that large temp statement might fill up your directory, so. So one night on a hackathon, we decided the solution was load data should go away. Uh, unfortunately, there's no option in tools like MySQL import, like there probably should be, so we decided to write it ourselves. So we figured we'd take the same CSV output, tab separated, uh, that you get by default with load data. And we convert each CSV line into a row in an extended insert statement that you customize for bulk length. And then in between each insert statement, we thought it'd be a good idea to see if the replicas were lagging because we were inserting too much data. Or if maybe thread count had gotten really high on our master. So this was sort of what we came up with. For each production database, obviously that'll vary how you get that. Get the list of production replicas that we care about. And then for each DB, load the data just like we did before. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as load data. Load data obviously saves us the headache of having to do a lot of things, like parsing. So we had to do that ourselves. And then there's other things to consider. Do you want to allow a tool that you've given to your developers to do things like ignore or replace? I don't know, maybe. So we put it together and it did work really well. Uh, loads do take longer obviously because load data is, again, super fast and parse is better. I suppose that's a feature request for extended insert. And the other thing we thought maybe would fix this, instead of making insert faster, maybe load data should have an optional limit on the size of the transaction it handles. And if you do run into this problem, I don't recommend using PHP in retrospect. Because this is what we do to had, to, had to do to handle the null byte, which is a lot of work just for a single character that I'm not sure how it got in wall data anyway. But the upside to all this, well, maybe one night hackathon work, was that we have a tool that we can hand off to developers and uh, doesn't break replication, doesn't cause massive lag, doesn't fill up disks, and uh, doesn't have any production impact. So we can run this pretty much all the time. And again, if, as we launch things like new features like timeline and other stuff, we, we do find that we're migrating all kinds of data or even stuff from Hadoop that comes out in a nice CSV format all the time. And the code will be up probably soon. Although I didn't get a hold of anyone to get that cleared before this. Because I'm lazy. But uh, yeah, that's it. I think we're pretty much out of time. Anyone have any questions? Cool. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks.